Hi everybody and welcome to the video. My name is David Hanna of Cornerstone Tax and today we're going to be talking about family investment, how and why you should structure it. And uh, before we get into more detail, if when you get to the end of this video, please click like and subscribe. But more importantly, I'm going to explain how we've recovered over £15 million in overpaid stamp duty in the last 12 months alone. But let's get into it. Why family investment and what kind of structure? First and foremost, the purpose behind family investment structures, and whatever type they are, is to allow capital to be passed to the next generation, to allow efficient management of family investment and the preservation of wealth down the generations, and also to a degree to induct the next generation and possibly even the generation beyond that in the sound principles of capital, wealth generation, and wealth management and protection. Most families tend to start with what I would describe as the head figures. Usually, of course, this is grandma and grandpa, but it might not be. And generally, they will have had some children. And for this purpose, we'll assume they've had three. They've invested, they've built up a business, sold it out, and they've ended up with a significant slug of capital. And usually that capital is represented by direct investments handled by a fund manager. But they've also usually built up a portfolio of property, and indeed, they may have invested in other businesses, including their children's business. And it's these areas that need management, because these have the most exposure to capital gains tax, inheritance tax, and all the things that go with it. And they want to preserve this wealth to be able to pass it down to this next generation, and possibly the generation beyond. So how could they do this? Well, there are a number of well-known structures. Ironically, the easiest of them is a family partnership. You might have heard of the phrase family investment company, sometimes referred to as a FICO. And that's just a limited company that serves to exist and manage the family's wealth. The advantages of an investment company over a partnership are simply investment companies pay tax at corporation tax rates, generally lower, partnerships pay at income tax rates, generally higher, and similarly capital gains, particularly on residential property, are payable at a lower rate by investment co's than they are by partnerships. Now you might also have heard the term family trusts, and trusts are, from an operational standpoint, the least attractive of all the possible choices. They get taxed at a flat rate of 45% on income tax. They get no special capital gains exemptions and there can be both entry charges on inheritance tax and indeed what are called 10 year anniversary charges where the awards of interest under the trust are not fixed, they're discretionary. So these days trusts have become largely unfashionable. Indeed, e offshore trusts are definitely unfashionable. And so you're left with one other choice, and this is a rather interesting one, which is a form of international pension scheme, sometimes referred to as an IPS. And international pension schemes can be used to provide long-term income for the oldest generation whilst preserving capital for the next generations. So let's take this in a little bit more detail. Family partnerships are interesting. You might have mum and dad and the siblings all in a partnership. As I've already said, income taxes, not good. Capital gains tax, not good. But there's a wider issue than tax here. Generally in partnerships, all the partners have to agree over decisions and that can lead to, I'll call them, management issues. Also similarly, but within limits, even limited liability partnerships, the individual partner's assets and the assets of the partnership are attackable by anybody who's claiming from any one of the partners. Think of a bad marriage or a Little Johnny over here has got involved in some dodgy business or lost half a million on Bitcoin or whatever. 
the claimant against him could have a claim on the partnership assets, thereby moving some part of the partnership assets out of part family control or indeed forcing a, a sale of the assets with ruinous tax consequences. Family companies, on the other hand, are limited liability entities and they have several unique features. The whole of the family could be shareholders, but they don't all have to be directors, leaving mum and dad, the first generation, in charge while they gradually train up the kids on how to manage the portfolios and to evaluate opportunities. Limited liability protection in a company, any claim on a shareholder will only attach to the shareholder's shares. It won't force a sale of the assets in the business. It might force the other shareholders to acquire any shares that were awarded as part of the claim. But you can see how that's starting to limit the damage potential. The other possibility is to have the shares in the limited company all or partially owned by the International Pension Scheme. Why is that important? Well, again, you get the benefit of limited liability protection. All the underlying investments are protected. And all or nearly all of the shares are owned by the International Pension Scheme. And what that will mean is nobody can claim against the pension scheme because international pension schemes are outside the pension splitting arrangements under the divorce courts in the UK. So even a divorce will not affect the family's wealth. Similarly, creditors claiming against somebody who goes bankrupt in the UK cannot claim against the assets of the pension fund. So it's a part of an overall strategy which you need to deploy. So how do families generally start? Well, simply put, you don't need a pension scheme to start with. But generally what most families do is start with the family investment company, the FICA. Assets are contributed or sold into the FICA by mum and dad, grandma and grandpa, depending on who's watching this, hi kids. And they will probably take payment in the form of debt so that that gives them the ability to be paid cash out at capital gains rates rather than income tax rates. They won't need to take a dividend as long as the debt they're owed by the Family Investment Co is uh, still outstanding. The Family Investment Co then invests its money, realises its income from its assets, pays its expenses and that rolls up as dividends due to the shareholders after mum and dad have been paid. And it's a rather neat way of transferring value over time because if you start with a five million pound portfolio with five million owed to mum and dad, over time the shares in this company are all worth a pound. This is no balance sheet. Over time, of course, as that debt is extinguished, the shares grow from one to five million. And if 80% of the company is owned by the kids, say, 80% of that five million transfers to them with no tax consequences, with no inheritance tax, no potential inheritance tax, because you've not gifted anything away. Of course, clearly mum and dad's estate is declining over time. At any stage, you can choose to plant your international pension scheme over the top of the FICO, exchanging value again, and then that produces a 100% inheritance tax firewall because the bulk of the value is now up here, not in here or in the debt owed to mum and dad, and that will pro produce an instant reduction in the potential inheritance tax. And that's part of a medium term plan. But the most important thing is management. If you're going to form one of these and your mum, mum and dad are going to be the only directors, what's going to happen as they get more elderly and they die? So you need to bring the next generation in. And I'm going to 
use a very short term for what is in fact a very long piece of paper. It's called a shareholders agreement. When you start to get the kids in, it's important that you set the rules for the conduct of the company, not just while your mum and dad are alive, but also when they've gone. There should be a strict shareholders agreement which regulates what the board may or may not do and how many people have to vote in favour and what the sanctions are. Like a lot of agreements, they're only of any use once people start to fall out. If you're all in agreement, you don't need one. But if you're not in agreement, that's when you need an agreement. Sounds silly, but that's the way it is. Every good solicitor will say, we're not worried about the marriage, we're worried about regulating the divorce in commercial terms. So broadly, that's why these structures are selected. A lot of people start with the partnership, go to the company, and then ultimately, depending on the retirement plans, as it were, many end up with a pension. Interestingly, international pension schemes can take shares in structures like this. They can take shares in any kind of trading business. They're not as limited as UK pension schemes. They're, not even, as, they're even less limited than small self-administered recognised pension schemes because even they have limits on the amount they can lend back to related companies. These are regulated and recognised, but they're not recognised pension schemes in that sense. They qualify as pension schemes, but they're very much wider ranging in their authorised investments. And so a lot of people, particularly internationally mobile people, have found these very, very flexible vehicles. This was not intended to be a deep dive into it. Indeed, you would need incredibly detailed advice because each structure needs to accommodate the needs of the family, the, the capital needs of the parents. And I suppose this is the point in the video where I perhaps ought to introduce ourselves. We're Cornerstone Tax. We were established in 2006 and we're primarily known for stamp duty. In fact, over the last 12 months, we've recovered over £14 million in overpaid stamp duty for our clients and advised on a few family structures because in the uncertain times that 2020 and 2021 created, more people were focused on the issue of dying, although you might fairly say not dying, but what was going to happen to their wealth if they died than at any other time in recent history. So if you think we could help you on this or indeed in doing a review of your recent stamp duty purchases to see if we can get you a refund, please click on the link in the video below and also click like and subscribe and you'll hear more from us soon. I've been David Hanna. Thank you for listening.